called learning tech it was much easier to say <laughs> but this is fancy right and all the slides can be found here I have at the end I have a bunch of links for resources for you as well so if you just go to the tiny URL you'll be able to get it I did upload a document with that link to the Dropbox uh, location as well so you'll be able to get it both ways um, anyway so why did you want to come to the session? Okay. I produce a lot of documents and uh, I, I have actively ensured that they are accessible. Okay. Okay. I was really attracted to your client as a brain because to me, PDFs are problematic in a way that Word documents and PowerPoints are not. So. Uh, those can be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, why else are you here? Our LMS has an app to it. They color code and they document them. And the goal is to have all green because it's the so accessibility. Ah. So, when I see orange or red, it's either one or two things. It's always either a PDF or a PowerPoint. Ah. And those are the two that I consistently have to find some way to convert. Okay, so, so Ally. Right. 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 Who uses Ally in their campus here? Oh, cool. So we have, so you're familiar with the little colorful gauges, right? right? Mm -hmm. like, oh my god, it's all red! Yeah, yeah, that's the most easy. Wow, that's a lot of course. I'm going to see that. Oh, okay, it's great. <laughs> the next week it's red. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, pretty crazy. I know. Okay, great. Well, I'm thankful you're here. So please feel free to ask any questions, interrupt me at any point. Um, but we'll get started. Okay? So I'm just going to start with the Office of Civil Rights uh, definition. I really like of what accessible means. So basically, we want anyone to be able to have access to the same interaction, get to the same content like anyone else. Fair, that's how I think it's right. We want to get to that point without any accommodation, right? Okay, 
Why do you think it's important to make content accessible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Follow laws. Yeah. Follow laws. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know a lot of my students that take advantage of accessibility oh. things that are you know, they're not at the you know, status quo, but they can take advantage of it because it's already. It's, I mean, seriously, I mean, they're reading when they're tired at night, so they can look at the text and hear the reading. And, yes. You know, we convert it into different forms. I mean, probably more than anything. Yeah. When the DSS stuff's important, yeah. everybody can take it. And I don't know when. So. Yeah. Whoever's students, if you're long, all their people, they're all going to have a disability, like to take advantage of be able to listen. Something. Some things, right? And there's so many invisible disabilities to different levels, right? But uh, research says that the more senses we engage in learning, the more deep the learning and durable the learning is. So if we listen and read at the same time, it is better learning. So and we so have tons of they have families, they work full time, they're going to go to school, they hardly get any sleep, right? So I'm trying to make the most of their time. Okay. Any other reasons? Yes. Well, I think because um, I advise faculty, and um, you know, and kind of initially it was just sort of to reply to their. I don't have somebody with a disability in my class, mm -hmm. but then as I worked through so many things, I realized that that wasn't just a kind of reply to say, well, it just benefits everybody, mm -hmm. because it really does mm -hmm. benefit um, a, a document or a PowerPoint or like any kind of. You know, document or online presentation. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of best practices that are involved in accessibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So here's some comments that are collected in a couple presentations when I've asked this question, right? From faculty members, from designers, uh, and a lot of very similar to what you have mentioned. It's very common, right? Um, and um, you know, mentioned the universal design to promote equity. I had a comment, but I couldn't say it in there. It was interesting. They said so they can get to the documents, be able to access the content, and not say that they were not told. For example, the syllabus, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, they said, you makes my job easier, it's in there. <laughs> and I know it's accessible, so I know you can get to it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> no excuses, exactly, exactly. OK, here's some disability facts. OK, approximately 61.4 Americans uh, have reported they have some sort of disability. And this is according to, so I'm give you the source correct, and it is in the notes of this slide. Uh, this is from the CDC uh, 2016 data. And out of those, we have some that uh, show hearing trouble. We have some numbers for hearing trouble and vision trouble, but we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, approximately 30% of professionals have disclosed some sort of disability in the United States. And that data is from the Center for Talent Innovation Report. Okay, let me focus on disclosed, on that word, right? Okay, according to the, this, uh, let's see, where's the other one? Uh, Oh, it's not in here. I must have deleted it. According to another report from the National uh, Data Statistics for Students that attract students, about 11.4% of students have disclosed a disability. Again, emphasis on disclosed. Right? How many times do we find that we have students in classes that are not registered with the disability office and they need an accommodation? It could be anxiety for testing. It could be extra time that they need because it takes them longer, right, to do things. It could be dyslexia, even if it's mild, many things. So uh, this number grossly underestimates how many students have some sort of disability. Yeah, I have to admit, it's harder to see in online classes than it is face-to-face when a student has an undisclosed disability. Yes. Because it's that's all, right? Okay, and about, you know, out of this 61.4 million Americans and approximately 38.3 million reported hearing issues of some sort and about 26.9 million have some sort of vision issue. Okay, 
So let's look at some formats of documents and content. And so the projecting is terrible. I wish it was clear. <laughs> okay, so this is an example of a Canvas page right here, and which is also could be equivalent to like a web page because it's basically a web page. An LMS is like a page in Blackboard too, you know, would be similar to that. Uh, an office document, a PDF, PDF form. What is the best format to use? Okay, so let's say for course, for course materials. Let's say we go right now. Office documents. Office documents. Only because then I can delete headers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. In some ways, the, the HTML. Okay, why is that? Um, you, um, uh, it, it crosses more accessibility uh, guidelines uh, without having to kind of fix them more purposely. That's what I meant. Well, uh -huh. some of the canvas stuff is because they actually do some stuff that's not accessible that you don't see if you understand what's going on there with the high frames and things. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, software, Office software, has accessibility features baked in. For example, with Mac, you can do you know, voice, um, voice, text to voice. So uh -huh. if that's already on the web, then all you have to do is just activate that and have uh -huh. the text rectangle. Oh, that's Whereas right. on a PDF, that would be much better. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Office is good because it has a lot of the tools that are, you know, just product, productivity tools actually make things more accessible. And it's something faculty can wrap their heads around. Right. It's something you use all the time. We use it, you know, we use PowerPoint, we, we're pretty familiar with Word, right? Right. And then, uh, and then so you had a point there with HTML pages and text. In terms of what is the most accessible, Type of content. Number one is HTML. But any content can be made inaccessible. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, when best practices are followed, HTML, then office documents, then, okay, if I'm going to grade in some way, HTML, office documents, and then I go PDFs, mm -hmm. and then PDF forms is like, Imagine you know that you are very, very deep, close to hell. <laughs> That's where they live. <laughs> and it is just, do you remember when PDF was the answer to everything? Right? It's like, oh my gosh, so many people don't have access to Office. Right? And then you sometimes download the stupid viewers and it wouldn't work. And so, oh, we can PDF it. Oh my gosh, everyone can download that little add in and they view it and everyone can print. <gasps> Big form in the market. For a product that it takes a lot of work to make accessible for assistive technologies. Any of them. And PDF forms are in, my <laughs> in, uh, in the bad category for me, really bad, because it takes like at least twice as much work to make them accessible. Mm -hmm. And after that, they're only accessible on PC systems, not on Macs. Mm -hmm. I know that. Where? PDF forms that have been remediated and made accessible, they're only accessible on PCs, not on Macs. Macs will still have issues with them. Well, I gotta stick out a couple of things. I gotta stick about PDFs from the students send them to me because that's the thing. My LMS doesn't screw up the formatting on the paper mm -hmm. for formatting. Okay. I'm not saying don't ever yeah. use them. I know, I just got to stick up for it. Oh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But a little guy. That's okay, that's okay. It's that compassion. We always feel compassionate, right? Empathetic. That's good. All right. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is an example of a syllabus. Okay, does it look well formatted, structure? You know, does it look okay? Are we talking about accessibility? Oh, it's good. Accessibility, organization, you know, structure. Organization is okay, but accessibility I can't tell because I can't tell things are labeled and annotated. Oh. And I don't know what's an image uh -huh. and what's not. Right. Yeah. Yeah, do they use headings or do they just make the text bigger and bold? Right? Mm -hmm. Right? You, you, they look like headings, right? Mm -hmm. Can I have the same problem with Word documents to be honest? Mm -hmm. 
the Word document is heavy. So for part of our problem is, is accessibility means I can download it when I'm freaking out in the woods. And I gotta have the satellite around it on my phone to download something. So well, it's not necessarily a good answer. Really. If I don't need them to edit stuff, I need them to edit stuff in the documents, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or if they're right on campus where documents work great mm -hmm. for office products. I mean, honestly, the PDF is light. It can be. They can be heavy. It's built, right? Yeah, right. They can be heavy. They can be big files. So it depends. Yeah. But right. for the most part, they tend to be like. It's not an edit file for me ever. Right, but in terms of editing. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah, can yeah. download, you have a local so you don't have to be connected to the internet. Right. Right? And then you can edit it. And then when you have connectivity again, you can upload it and upload it, right? So, as one advantage, instead of having to go edit your Word or PowerPoint, then make your edit, convert it to PDF, and then upload it. You can just upload it. Right? Okay, so if this was not formatted correctly, no hands were used or anything, someone using assistive technology will see it like this. Mm -hmm. If they're like, not going to paste it anymore. Well. <laughs> you know, so so it's like, can you tell how many exams there are by looking at this? So when someone uses a screen reader, they can they can isolate. It's the same way we see. Oh, there's a heading here and a heading there. I don't want a section. I want to read this section. Mm -hmm. They can also do keyboard commands and they go, okay, here's a section. Here's a section. Oh, I want to read this. They can do that. They can also tell how many links there are. You can jump from link to link. They can do. But if it's not formatted, this is what they get. They gotta go through the whole thing. So, so yeah. So it's, and then on top of that. They're looking at it like imagine looking at it through a tube. All that through like a tube. So it kind of. Okay, so here's some, we're going to get to the meat of this. General best practices for content. The transfer web pages, Word, PowerPoint, you know, uh, when we create content. Use color wisely and have enough contrast. And we're going to go into detail in just a minute. Use headings that we, you guys mentioned. Include alt text in images. Provide descriptive hyperlinks. Use tables for data and format correctly. Avoid empty lines, spaces in content. And use accessibility checkers. Mm -hmm. Simple? Does it seem simple enough? Okay. So we're going to go into each one of those. We'll start with Word. Okay, so talk a little bit about colors. So there should be enough contrast. There are many, many Americans who have, I mean, it's, it, the number is like about 40% of the population has some sort of color blindness. It could be very, very slight or very, very severe. And if we if don't have enough contrast, they just have a hard time seeing and reading what's in there. Uh, and that happens a lot on slides. Sometimes you go, oh, this thing is cool. It's got the soft colors. But oh, if someone has a little bit of color minus, that beautiful presentation is, is not usable for them. OK. So another one. Don't rely on color completely to, 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 uh, to uh, portray meaning. For example, when you see those forms, you know, forms it says, all the, all the required fields are marked in red. So color can be used, don't get me wrong, and it should be used because the, much of the population that we identify ourselves as visual learners, or we prefer pictures, we like things to be visual, right? And use color, but then also refer to things in a way that can be identified with other things than color. Maybe things with it, uh, you know, items with a triangle with a star are required, right? Uh, assignments A, B, and C that yeah, are required. And they can be in red. But yes. Being colorblind doesn't mean, doesn't mean you don't see it. It means you just don't see it in color. You don't see it in color. So, you, so as long as you're watching contrast, mm -hmm. you're still, you should still be okay. Right, right. But if they cannot tell what red is, and you only set things in red, that's the only way you identify it, they won't be able to tell. Because everything looks grayish. 
depending if it's like a blue deficiency or red deficiency or a green deficiency or a combination. Mm -hmm. There's somebody who's doing green reader can't see with it see the color involved. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's a tool called the Color Contrast Analyzer. There's a link to the tool. It's free. Available for PC or Mac. You have you used it? Ah, oh, that's great. So it's really easy to use, easy to install, quick program, and you can test the contrast on any document, whether it is an office document or some web. Let's say you're even working on a Google Slides document. You can test the contrast. And and then you won't need to remember that the minimum requirement luminosity for contrast is 4.5 to 1, according to the web uh, accessibility standards, 2.1. You don't need to remember that because the app will do it for you. And here's an example. This is what it looks like. And I'm using it in one of the pages from this presentation. The original theme, when I checked it, it told me that it failed down here. There was not enough contrast because of the kind of color. So I found a darker color and replaced it. And then it passed. It just needs to pass. The minimum is double A for regular text and for large text. And the app will tell you that. You don't need to remember. Is it also, can you put in the R RGB? Because um, I use Webbing's color contrast, but I always have to then go somewhere mm -hmm. first and figure out the RGB to hex. Yes, you um, can. You can. So there? yeah, so right here, there's some settings in the app. And, and you can play, and you can change that to RGB yeah. and enter those instead of the hex. Awesome. And you can also play with the, the sliders and then find the color right there yeah. until it passes. And it's like, oh, that's the color I need to change it to. Mm -hmm. And then and you can look at the hex. Box, box. The, the text too, you have to just push up and down there too. Sorry, up the very top where mm -hmm. the code is. Mm -hmm. You go just to the left of it. Mm -hmm. Right there. Yeah. yeah. And you can get RGB. Uh -huh. yeah. Absolutely. It's a great tool. I use it all the time. Okay. So, everything okay? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so headings. They provide structure, right? They are required for uh, APA format, <laughs> right? Uh, they make it possible for to assistive technology tools to be able to to uh, check and, and find out what how the, the document is organized. And they can announce sections. The hierarchy. You know, H1, H2, H3, you know, the different heading levels. And one thing that is very important, many people, very many people don't know, is this right here. We live in a digital world. In Word, we have a title and subtitles that we're very familiar with that, because it usually goes on the title page. But for any documents that are going to be digital, that are going to be on a course management system, right, and on the web, the top level should be H1. That should be used as the title. Because on the web, H1 is the title. And the actual title of the document as we know it is actually part of the metadata of that content. It's behind the scenes. It is, it is it, it's there. But within the context of the document, H1 is the functioning title for that. So just to clarify, so yeah. if I'm doing a Word document, I should probably avoid using the title style and just stick with the heading one to mm -hmm. great size. Mm -hmm. cool. right. And only have one H1 for that. Yeah. Because that's the same application for Word. Yes. Mm -hmm. Only oh, Word you're talking about? Yes. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, in the web, I can use H1, but I can change H1 to whatever I want. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, you can leave it as H1, and then you can adjust the size and the color, right? But as long as it remains H1. Because then you can adapt it however you want so to. So is the adapter reader reading, reading that the elements in H1, or is it reading what's been done with the H1 on the web page? It's going to read the H1. So it's going to ignore whatever else I've done in my CSS to screw that up? No, it depends. Okay. Like, oh, that's a conference. Okay. It depends. If a person who uses a very powerful screen, such as JAWS, for example, mm -hmm. if they turn on features to recognize that data, or and things like bold and italics, things like that, they will recognize it's not going to get announced. The only thing that usually gets announced is, is it H1, is it H2? Have you, have you compared that to like what WebAIM and other checkers are playing for HTML content, how well they're doing? Mm -hmm. for that? Yeah, they're, they're pretty similar. Mm -hmm. 
problem with um, any automatic automated checker is I can only find things. Right? I mean, I can only find certain things that it's been programmed to find. It can't tell if your headings are correct. All it can tell is that they're not properly nested. Mm -hmm. It can see, yeah, you've got alt text. And, you know, you've got some alt text. It can't tell you if it's good alt text or if you have a copy keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah same yeah, with heading. You can't tell you you missed a heading. And all I can say is that you didn't nest it properly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Kind of like you would get the formatting, I did the old style sheets. Mm -hmm. Now that still has headings. Mm -hmm. So even though it's converted to a style sheet, the reader should still be able to read it. Yeah, because the, the style is applied via the CSS. No, I don't want to turn it off. I need to turn it off. That's true. The reader allows you to turn it off. Right, right. But if it's applied, it, it will then find as such. Okay. In some cases, it, they turn it off for yeah. their specific reasons where they do that. But it, they don't do it that yeah. often. You know, I ask these questions because I spend a lot of time teaching students about how yeah. complicated accessibility is like these like web pages are. Yeah. And that's yes. one of the things. I'm like, well, build a page so that if your CSS is off, then you can read it. Mm -hmm. And then build it so that it looks the way you want. Right. And then you got to do the in between stuff to make all the accessibility happen. It's, well, yeah, because it's we're, we're creating that content is for the users. Yeah. So we want to make sure it's accessible and it's usable, right? And they have a good user experience. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so here are the, the headers in order, and you're pretty familiar with those. They should always be used in order. If you need to change the size because some are too big, adjust the size. That's absolutely fine, but always use them in order. Don't jump to H4 because it's the size that you want and, and skip H3. Because for someone who cannot see it, it's very confusing. Because they're going, wait a minute, where's the H3 section? You jump to H4. And they are quite literate about heading style and many other styles and things that are applied to documents and content, because they have to be. I have a hard time that in our LMS, which is Sakai, uh -huh. when you get to like pages, the, um, the sections are auto the section titles are automatically H3. Uh -huh. And yeah. sometimes I have to be like a slightly, and, and I'm hoping that it's not like too bad, but sometimes it's like, because of an instructor or whatever, and you're helping them to kind of organize their content, uh -huh. um, is like, and four and five are really small. I've talked to our tech about that. But like sometimes it's like you do have to kind of play around as long as you're, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like, all right, the section is H3, but I'm going to start the content within that section is H3 also because then you have H4 and, you know, to kind of play around with. But it's really hard to kind of start at three on those pages. So the top level within the pages is H3? The, or is it the, the sections on the page, or you know, I mean, so we have like I don't know other. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, no. So, so but, yeah, I, I think what you're saying, for example, in Canvas, yeah, the highest level is H2 because H1 is the page in the title. Is right. the title of that page? Yeah, or the page name, right? And two is just sort of like up to anything. So we have the title is H1, and the section title on a page because you have like mm -hmm. that many sections that you want on a page is three. So I'm like, I'm not even sure what happened to two. With it. I guess <laughs> I guess it's like your faculty or you know whatever on the like, overview page or something like that. But by the time you're trying to think, it's already kind of automatically starting at three. So it's that's just the highest. Right. That's in there. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's start with three. Whether yeah. three is the the starting or it is the the highest level of sections, right? That you have. You can have H three and another H three and H fours inside of it. Yeah. But keeping in mind, you know, I always just keep in mind that like somebody's using this to, you know, to like a sort of a check within a you know a textbook chapter, right, to scan those headings mm -hmm. and just try to keep that in mind, the user experience, and try to keep it as, as right. Organized well, as if that's the case, it's built into the system, so they'll be able to tell where each one lives and where each two lives. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's great. Learn something new. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so the other thing is. Use the normal or pair for the paragraph, it's called normal in the styles, right? For text. And let's please say underline only for names. Mm -hmm. I know we use it for emphasis, but getting used to using it for emphasis, but it's why you're recognized and accepted as the visually it marks a link. Even if it's only by hovering when you see the underline, but it's a link. And it can be confusing. Even for someone who can see, right? Because when you're looking at something digital, it's like, oh, is it a link? It's not blue, but there are many links that are not blue or red, right? Or purple, whatever the color is. So, okay. So, basic steps. You're pretty familiar how to add headings, right? So, you highlight a section and you select from that uh, styles group in the ribbon 
and he looks like this. Very familiar with that, right? You just find what it is, and you select it. And this is just using that standard normal template that work has. And then you start with that, and you're going to get those blue. And it's like, oh, it's that blue again. <laughs> you can edit those. Keep that, and you can modify those. Uh, and I'm going to show you just one of the ways. There, there's more than one way to do it uh, coming up. Okay, You can right-click on any of those and select Modify. And then you can change the font size, the font itself, the appearance, the color, and then you save it. Okay, so let's say I have this ones in here, right? Mark them as each as each one. So when modify, and then it opens up a little editor, and you can select and change what it looks like and make it fit when and how well you want it to look. You don't have to be stuck with that. And if you change it here and you have more uh you know, H2s and H3s, and they will automatically update. So you don't have to change every single one. And the same, like you can see, as soon as that saves, the two H2s that I have in there will automatically update. Okay. And, okay, there you go. <laughs> All right. So here's a couple examples of headings. Very common to have a little table at the top of the syllabus, instructor information. You know, it could be committee members, you know, there are different types of documents. And we can really used to using tables at the top. That's really not a good use because tables are harder to navigate for people with a, a using a screen reader than, than, than going through. So here's a change from using a table and not using a table. Okay? And then if you go, well, wait a minute, but I want a couple consoles, that's it's not too long. I want to save some paper. Right? You can add sections and add columns in Word. You just have to add a section, add a column, and then, and then that way it becomes only for that section. Right? So you can do things like that without using tables. We just got too used to having tables and create things with them because we can. And custom tabs aren't an issue or anything like that. If I want to line things up nice and neat in Word, just use tabs. Um, oh, okay. So if you want to do that, you do the indent versus using tab, tab, tab. Oh, okay. Right, because that adds an empty space. That is with empty space. Empty space. The same with adding empty space at the end. Adding an extra line to add space, it will be that empty line. And in, in, even in programs, when even machines interpret programs that are written, if they see an empty line, it usually marks the end of the content. So that is the assumption, especially if there's more than one. It's like, oh, there must be X. Empty line, empty line. Let's see the end. Okay. Uh, how many of you use alt text in your in your images? Oh, very cool. And does that mean that you have to come up with a wonderful creation of alt text for each one of those? Maybe it's just decorative. If it's decorative, wonderful thing about the latest version of Office 2016 and 2019 that you can check a box that says "Mark as decorative." Before that, they would just the only way was to say, put the word decorative in the description. So if you're using an older version, or you're in a system where you get a title and a description field when you're adding out text, only add to the description. The title gets ignored a lot of times, so you need to do that extra work. Well, the automatic check mark is decorative, take it off the checker list. Right? Yes, and, well, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you don't need to include, if you are describing the image, Image off, photo off, there's no need. I know it's our tendency to want to express it well, but it gets announced, image already. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's split twice if you do, right? Just say what the meaning of that image is in that context. That's what matters. Why do you put that there? You may need to go a little bit longer if it's a complex, if it's a graph. And then figure out what is important about this graph. What do I want to know? Maybe it's not every single number, but what are the, the key points? Right, so that's what alt text is about. Okay, so usually you right click and you can get either the older version, you gotta go to format picture, or in the new version, you just right click and, and just select alt text, edit alt text, right? The older version, it was a little bit convoluted because first you go format picture, then it opens up that panel, and then you go to find this, the layout and properties tab, and then from there you find the alt text. This kind of heavy. Right? And they only write in the description. 
you know, but the new one in 2019 is much nicer because it just goes straight to edit all text. Mm -hmm. Yay! <laughs> oh, look, Micah's decorative! <laughs> yeah, it really helps if you're about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so much nicer. So I'm mean, just glad for those changes. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, Microsoft announced that they were they were doing that, I was so excited, but it seemed like it took forever. So when are they adding that? Because the University of Washington works with Microsoft the partner in making their products more accessible. And so I hear about things and it's like, when? Oh, soon. <laughs> and I was like, when? Soon. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, okay. So, you familiar with descriptive hyperlinks? Mm -hmm. Basically means they're descriptive, right? You put the link behind what it is. It gets announced by screen reader saying, link, and it will say, link, creating accessible Word documents, versus link, canvas, period, instructor, period, com, forward slash, courses, you know? And then, especially, like, how about those links for the like, Google Docs? With all those random characters, imagine trying to figure out what that is. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but this makes it, I mean, and it looks nicer. It's, it adds more uh, comprehension to the content versus having the whole link, right? To disturb what you're trying, the, the flow you're trying to create. Uh, also, if sometimes, because some things need to be printed, you lose the link, if it's a Word document, right? Just remove the HTTP and the three W's to shorten it up. Because in our modern browsers, we don't need that. So that will take a little bit of that complexity out. And if it's a long, complicated link, you can use something like Bitly or TinyURL. Make it short. Easy and short. The last thing about links, avoid the click here or link by, the, by themselves. Imagine a page that says, read more, read more. Link, click here, click here and the person has no, can't see it and they have no context. What those, because this one say, link, click here. Link, read more. So, so always be very descriptive. Okay, and it's, and it's fairly easy. You highlight and then usually you can go right click hyperlink or go to the insert hyperlink and then add it. Very straightforward. Okay. Tables. Oh my gosh. We have gotten so creative with tables. I had a lot of fun with them too. So I'm like, oops, I shouldn't have done that anymore. Yeah. Um, they're made for data, numbers. I mean, uh, it's a course schedule. It's actually the use of the table as long as it's formatted well. You're like, uh, when you're having like rate conversions, you know, A is percent, B is so many points, you know, any of those, that's fine. Right? But if it's just to organize content to make it look pretty, eh, I mean, I do have to confess, uh, in helping faculty create really nice home pages like in Canvas, we made a few exceptions because if we create a fully accessible layout, they we have to use the div tag. Uh, anyone knows what a div tag is? You can remember that? So the div tag creates can create a structure similar to a table. But it, it flows and it rearranges. It's, it's responsive, mm -hmm. right? But it's really easy to mess that up. Yes, sure. <laughs> you know that, right? So because we wanted to the page, we were thinking about this home page to be usable for instructors, so they could update it, right? We did a table, but we added all text that describes the use of that table, and we made it as simple as possible. So you unrecommend divs because no, I recommend divs, but think about your user. Yeah. Right? If you're creating something, you have to some, create something for someone else to use, it yeah. needs to be something that they can use. Right. So that's why we have a lot of content creators on just one site. Mm -hmm. So right. whatever like the simple version is, is so divs are mm -hmm. people would have a harder time, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, because it's so easy. You can copy and paste something and mess up the whole thing. It's like everybody, it broke. Okay, good. Because they went into another day for they eliminated this bad or something. It's so easy, so you know what you're doing, right? So it was it was it was ease of use in that case. Um, okay. So one thing about tables, unless you absolutely need to have a complex table which is merging cells, just avoid them. But if you, in some cases, you have to, and that's okay. But if you don't need to, don't merge them just to make them look pretty. 
right? Because we do that. Oh, we're going to make you stop one because it's the title of the table. No, then that means you don't need that top one. That means it needs to be outside, right? That would be the caption of the table, right? And then the table. All right. So uh, the steps how to format tables correctly. You went to table properties and how to add a caption. They're right here. So we select the whole table. See how they're separate because they're two different pages? Okay, so we're going to go to table properties. Then we're going to install all of the selected, then row, unselect, allow row, allow row to break, and select the repeat header row. And that makes us all together. And if it's a multi page table, the header will appear on the top of each table. So you can tell what goes where, how it's connected. That's part one. Captions. Right click, insert caption. And then usually automatically that's table one or table two or whatever. You cannot edit that there, but after you insert it, you can click on that text and remove that table one or table two out of there if you don't want it. Okay so far? And like I said, you'll have access to all of this so you can watch them. And uh, I'll give you more stuff even at the very end that you can check out later. Okay, empty lines. We're talking about that. Tab, empty lines. So we cover this. The way to do that instead of manually enter space by the keyboard, there's a feature to add space. And it doesn't register an empty line or empty space, right? It is using the line spacing options in the home ribbon, which is located over here, that little thing right there, right? And then you can say, okay, I want to put spacing before or after. So I added spacing between that first line and the picture of my TV card. <laughs> so um, so that's how we add space. And it could be, you know, six points, it could be 14 points, you know, whatever you think you need, and it's not an empty line, it's just space. So that's not get announced. Okay, talk about accessibility checkers, right? Accessibility checker and ward is under the review tab. Check accessibility. It opens up a panel. That shows you errors, warnings, and tips, why it's important to fix it, and the steps to fix it. I'm still waiting for Microsoft. They're supposed to put some buttons in here. It's like fix now or something like that. Yeah, it's coming. It's so, soon. Soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's no money involved. Yeah. It's on the list. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's coming. We got the test and giving feedback. It's like, hey. Your accessibility checker is not accessible. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> so, so anyway, but that's it. That's a checker for work. So you can check your documents, and it will let you know. See, like this one had what I was checking. It had like four characters. Like, what the hell is that? If you click on it, it will take you to that line where those are. So you don't have to guess. Yes. Is there an accessibility checker you recommend for things like storyline? Ah. The best thing that you can do is download if uh, if you use Windows, download MVDA and I have to use that's a free screen. Is it MVDA? MVDA. Mm -hmm. It's a free screen reader. Right. Something like that's more complex and you want to check. You start simple, right? Start simple, see if you can navigate on the keyboard. So are some basic things, right? Um, in Windows, you can turn over the narrator, but it doesn't fully work like a screen reader. Mm -hmm. But you can do simple checking. Okay. You know, so you can narrate and you can hear if it announces a heading, if it announces a list, you know, listen for those things. But to fully do it, you do more than one screen reader. That's okay. There's no foolproof automatic tool out there. Okay. That's why there's so many consulting companies making a lot of money. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyway. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Keep text at 24 points, but not less than 22, so it's readable for the people you're presenting, right? Uh, although my syllabus example, the second page with all the text, but I was thinking it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so um, use the built-in layout, you know, for the style content, title content to content boxes, right? Just title, title page, section, you know, use the built-in because all of those pieces are very designated. What happens sometimes is like, oh, I'm just gonna have a text box right here and a text box right here, and pretty soon you have a big mess that's hard to navigate. It looks great, right? But right, so for someone who's using assistive technology, it's completely confusing. Okay, uh, make sure, of course, you have enough contrast, because that's where it happens. I mean, it happens in Word documents as well, but it happens a lot more in PowerPoint, because we find these beautiful templates, right? And it's like, no, nah, enough contrast. Okay, one quick way to check accessibility, even for the checker. In PowerPoint, if you go to view and go to outline view, whatever shows in the outline is what it recognizes as heading, which would be the, the, basically the title of the slide, and each slide should have a title, and then list, and, the, and you'll see your uh, bullets. If it doesn't show up there, it's going to be very confusing because it's not recognizing it. So they're going to navigate and run into something, but it's not going to make sense to someone who cannot see it, not see it well. But that's where you use title, not H1. <laughs> right, right. It's the title, yeah, right. Yes. But if you use the built in template, the built in right, layout, you, you always have the title, right? Mm -hmm. It's designated as such. Trick, let's say you have a beautiful slide of a picture. You don't need a title. Put a title anywhere and then hide it. It's still there for structure, but the other users don't need to see it. So, yeah, we just just hide it. Are talking about that slide or? Ah, I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, this uh, to check the reading order, we look at this. Like, so, you start with the title. It should be read boom, 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 usually, right? Or like this and over, the same way we read. Uh, when we add extra elements, it might jump around. Right, but to check the reading order, there's this thing called a range in the home tab, and in, within that is something called the selection pane. That's where you can do things, including hiding that title that you don't need to be able to see. Okay, so in the home ribbons, a range, selector pane, and it opens up that pane, and then you see, wait a minute, title is last, and the text is first. What the heck? You can drag and rearrange, but in PowerPoint, what's last is read first. It's backwards. Don't ask me why. They program by that way, you know? I stopped wondering about it. It's just the way it is. Next to those little guys, there's a little eye icon. That's how you hide it. You click on it, it disappears, but it's still there. Programmers being lazy on the XML file that they have to read to do that. That's why. Oh, yeah, it's okay. It's a feature. Because they're reading an XML file and so they read it from the bottom up instead of the top down. That and makes a lot of sense. Resort. That's why yeah. that's happening. Because they're young, right? They're 20 something or 30 something. Mm -hmm. They're geniuses. <laughs> so they don't see things the way. So the, the world should accommodate everything around them. I'm not trying to make excuses for them, but that's not <laughs> That's not happening. Been around a long time. That, that makes a lot that's of sense. Of right. So, but in PowerPoint, it does, you know, so you just have to remember at the bottom that gets, it goes from the bottom up. I think I read. And it always, if you click on any of those, it will, it automatically will highlight that item. So you can go to it directly. Okay. So, PDFs. The question that's part of the title. Does it need to be a PDF? Why? We know about images, image videos, right? Also, there's a wonderful, it was time practice. Instructors, uh, they uh, scan pages of a text. So students don't have to buy a textbook for a chapter or two. And it falls under for use. But many times those are image videos. Or, they are scanned in a way so there's all this black around, they're hard to read. They have to read for everybody, not just for uh, you know, people with disabilities. So, so, um, so some things to think about. 
Also, this is uh, believe that I didn't have a PDF because that way you still can't change it. PDFs can be changed. There are free programs, converters out there, they can be edited. Even secure ones. I found that despite searching, you can remove security and password in PDFs. Free tools. So, if someone's wanting to do it bad enough, they can do it. <laughs> it's really handy if you ever need to edit a PDF. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is my question: is um, uh, is it worth converting a document to PDF in an online course, or is it better just to say just upload your Microsoft Word? I mean, first of all, faculty have to if they need to make a change, which they always do. They have to make sure that they upload both anyway into the resources because. They, they, they probably don't have Adobe Pro to edit the PDF, and it's very difficult to edit a PDF if you've ever tried anyway. Um, so in some ways, it would reduce their work, but is that kind of a general recommendation to just, if you don't have to use a PDF, don't use it? Mm -hmm. Okay, Absolutely. Good. that's good to know. Just because I want to recognize. Hmm? Word can edit PDFs. You'll find out how well the PDFs go, but you won't forget any word. <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, they can yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. there's times I build stuff in Google Docs or Word, right. and I save it as a PDF. And, mm -hmm. you know, then I write it through the checker and figure out what's screwed up. And, right. So if you know how to do that, you can fix it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, PDFs now, are always evil. Now, <laughs> 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 I have students that cannot like, download Word Docs. They're too big. But seriously, the size yeah, of the Yeah, oh, I understand that. Oh, or, I'm yeah, picky I'll, about when I do the PDF. I just do mm -hmm. anyway. Right, right. No, I understand that. So, so yeah. So, so use your judgment, right? It let's not use it like we're used to using them. Like everything. Yeah. Boom, mean shirt production, right? PDF, PDF, right. PDF. Right. Like we're used to. Let's think about it a little more thoughtfully, right? Okay. Now, does it need to be a word, a word document? Can it be a contemplation side the elements? Imagine that. <laughs> that you, there's no downloading, uploading. Certain things can be a content page. Mm -hmm. And you can add your headings, you can use lists, you can have descriptive hyperlinks, mm -hmm. alt text, all of that. Do you say the LMS is updated to be able to print a page, an LMS page mm -hmm. better? Like I would like to see yes, that analogy. Mm -hmm. um, because that is kind of a consideration with documents is that all oh, students can download it, right? And, uh, yeah. and, and or print. Right? Then again. Yeah. Students can always print a PDF. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not, a, yeah. not a, like a, a word. an LMS page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Chrome, it comes with it. Or Firebase, you can print a PDF and download a PDF. Or save it as Microsoft yeah. Yeah. You can. Oh. If they can use that, they can. They, can but they have choices. But, but then what we're providing in the beginning is accessible. If yeah. they come up with something inaccessible, that's on them. Right. <laughs> right, that's on them. Right. 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 But they, have, they made a choice, right? Mm -hmm. We do not take that choice away from them. Right. Okay. So one cool thing I don't know if I does this. So any Blackboard users here? Okay, there are a few here. Okay. So I don't know about Blackboard either. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, but Canvas, I recommend faculty to put as much content on Canvas pages or content pages, right? Mm -hmm. Because you put it in there, you do the descriptive hyperlinks, and they go, oh my gosh, but if my students spread that, they're going to lose their links. Canvas automatically prints the full URL next to it, whether it will print to PDF or print to paper. Mm -hmm. So check out and see if that's possible on Blackboard. It might be even a teacher request if it doesn't do it. Because that's like something amazing, right? And then, that's awesome. Yeah. So I thought it was super cool when I found that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as we're thoughtful in creating PDFs, if we create PDFs, um, so, uh, just make sure that the source document is accessible. Mm -hmm. That Word document or that PowerPoint, but PowerPoint, you know, it has so many elements. Just upload the PowerPoint, but if there's a special reason, the Word document, right? Then make sure you follow the practices. And then do the Save As PDF for more, right? Don't do print to PDF. Do the Save As, and if you're using a PC, um, and the, when you do the save as, there's a little options button. Make sure that, oh, not yet. Make sure that there's, a, there's going to be a list of different settings, little checkboxes. 
that that uh, state tax for accessibility is checked. Usually in schools, that's part of the image. It's installed that way, but you can always check at least once. Because that will make sure that those tags, those little things that identify this is a heading, this is a list, this is a table, will transfer to the field. And that will make it tax readable. So it's not 100% accessible, but it's a heck of a lot more accessible. Right? And if it's a Mac, you don't need to do that, but you can do the save as PDF, but it uses an online service. So when it's saving PDFs, so make sure the PDFs are accessible or semi-accessible, it needs to be connected to the internet. Which I jump for joy because until 2016, well, mid-2016, Office 2016, you could not create tag PDFs from a Mac. This has to be connected to the internet. <laughs> That's as best as Microsoft could do for their rival. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I have a bunch of resources here. I teach an online class called Accessibility 101. And I created a self paced course that is public. And you guys can go check it out. And it's the one I shared in Northwest Med. It's the same one, but with some updates. So you can go and access, you won't be able to take the quizzes because you have to register, but you can view all of the content, go through all the lessons. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like if I can escape from here. Okay, so let's look at the first one. And then I'll open the next one, well that's opening. Okay, it's still loading, internet's slow. Okay, so this is the self-paced course version of My Accessibility 101. Usually I teach it a few times a year, and it's four weeks long. Faculty and staff take it from all three campuses at University of Washington. But it has all the sections starting out, like it's got the, you know, this is how the course is laid out, you know, design, good design practice to introduce the, co introduce the course. Some basics about accessibility, talk about MS Office, some of the stuff we talked about today. Uh, web accessibility, uh, including Canvas pages, web pages, advocacy. How do you start advocacy? This one specifically mentions some of the efforts we're doing at the University of Washington, creating the IT accessibility liaisons. It's a grassroots effort. People from different areas, staff or faculty, can be a liaison. Learn about accessibility and then share. Right? Uh, and then some additional content. The additional content has extra stuff in there, such as some, um, let's see, uh, PDF accessibility a little bit more in depth, if you want to learn a little bit more about Adobe Acrobat. Adobe Acrobat is still the gold standard. I mean, there's Fox that is trying and some other programs are trying, but still, Adobe Acrobat Pro is it for making PDFs accessible. So here are some, some tips in here, um, some le little lessons. Um, Introduction, if you want to learn about web accessibility stands, some, some of you are probably already familiar with YCAG, if you work on the web. If not, you're welcome to learn. <laughs> and that is under that uh, uh, Worldwide Consortium Accessibility Initiative. Uh, so the conformance level, what that means, the techniques, a little bit talking about automatic, automated testing, as well as some free tools you might be able to download, uh, manual testing, and remember, don't fully rely on automatic tools because no automatic tool is perfect. It will not catch everything. And some other checklists and things like that. So there's a lot of content in here. Um, so, so yeah. That is that. And then, and you, and this is publicly available. This is a, I hope you can kind of see it. Dang, it's not very, very visible. Um, this is a Canvas accessibility checklist. It's a little better. So this is on our website. Yeah, this is on our website. So this is a list I put together with some best practices for faculty. I mean, including introduction, why accessibility matters, and some accessible design principles. But then talks about Ally because we use it in Canvas, right? And then um, so some best practices on PDFs in a course. And this one, which is also a link on the slides, this is a page that leads you to the Seattle website. It has scanning best practices to produce clear scan pages that are OCR. So they're text-based versus images. Okay, and it shows examples of bad scan pages. Um, also, 
uh, working with librarians, I always tell them, I know you're trying to be nice, you find this wonderful article, and you download the PDF and you put it in the course, but many databases, and more and more each day, are off 